I want to introduce him from his book Social Character of Learning, 1989 from Sage. Political Agenda of Education, Sage, 1991. And it is retitled Politics of Education in Colonial India by Rutledge. What is worth teaching? 1992, first edition by Orient Longman, and the second in 1997. Learning from Conflict. The Child's Language and the Teacher by National Book Trust in 2000. Prejudice and Tried by Weeking and Penguin. Battle of Battle for Peace, 2007. A Pedagog, a Pedagog's Romance: Reflection on Schooling, by Oxford University Press, 2008. Sociological Perspective on Education, as a co-editor with uh, S. Shukla by Chanakya Publication. Democracy and Education in India. Social Change and Education in South Asia <coughs> and books which he wrote in Hindi Nile Aankho Wale Bagule a short story collection Shabdakar 1976 a very famous text Raj Samaj or Shiksha by Raj Kamal in 1991 Kumar Apne uh, ap Apne अपने दिशा दर्शन, अपने जीवन के संघर्ष और शिक्षक संस्थानों में अपने संघर्ष, सरकारों के साथ अपने संघर्ष शब्दों के साथ रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि वो अपनी बात हम सब के साथ रखें। मैं गर्म जोशी से आपने परिचय दिया मेरा। दरअसल मैं ज़्यादातर वक्त अपनी ज़िंदगी में दिल्ली यूनिवर्सिटी में रहा हूँ। बाकी स संबंध है वो समय समय पर रहा है जिस विषय पर आपने आज मुझसे बोलने के लिए कहा है डिजिटल लिटरेसी के शीर्षक से इस विषय को उठाने के लिए मैंने सोचा कि एक कल्पना की जाए Imagine we are in 2025, 20, let's say, five years from now. And around that time, a student uh, who is a student at present, but by then 2025, 20, is no more a student, but a budding writer. And that student writes a short story using his experience of the recent turmoil in various universities that you have seen. You say JNU hai, Jamia hai, Delhi Vishwadale hai, IIT Madras, um, Calcutta, Jadavpur. Aapne idhar ke hafto mein bahut si universities ki khabrein padhi hongi. So this student looks at all that news, remembers his own experience, including experience of violence that he might have faced or others have faced and he uses this human material, this experience I think somebody's mobile might be on so that's nice in a reasonable magazine let's say like Hans in Hindi Uska Shirshak bhi mainne socha hai Shirshak hai suppose ki jay uska Bhagdar Ye kahani chhapti hai, padhi jati hai और अब आप और दस साल आगे जाइए। Let's say we are now in 2035. That one of you is in the curriculum committee of a major university in North India, and you think, ah, that was a good story, and you think that should be in the syllabus. So you include it in the syllabus for BA second year literature. Uh, now, 2035 is still 15 years away, so we don't know how many uh, universities and colleges will survive from today, but hopefully there will be many new institutions by then. And if you are serving one of them, and you have the responsibility to revise the 
syllabus, create new uh, topics and uh, you know new guidelines. You think of that story and you decide to put it in the syllabus for BA second year classes. So now you imagine that all of us are uh, trying to teach that story in BA second year 2035. Now many of us may not be teachers of literature, may not, many of us may be teachers of history or teachers of uh, psychology or philosophy, sociology, any of these areas will do for building on this imaginary example with which I have started this talk. Of course, as a short story, it will be primarily the responsibility of a language or literature teacher to teach it to second year students. <coughs> so what will that teacher do? We can imagine that the teacher will make students uh, aware of uh, the plot of the story, the usual staple of a literature teacher is, you know, introduce the plot, the characters, the atmosphere, the technique, all this. Perhaps the future teacher will also do. Given how little has changed, uh, I'm not sure that these will change either. So that will be the primary sort of thing that uh, a teacher will want students to read the story, absorb the narrative, look at the um, plot, the characters, how they have been built, and so on and so forth. But then by then, I suppose literary theory would have made it necessary uh, for the teachers to think about contextualizing that story. That degree of pedagogic change, I suppose, must, has already happened, but will happen perhaps in all colleges and universities by then. So this teacher will face the question of how to contextualize the story. Uh, because the story is about things that happened 15 years earlier. So she decides to contextualize it by um, looking at some of the content of that story, which is of course deeply political. It's uh, situated in the times that we are in at present. Um, and the debates of our time are reflected in it. Polarities of our time are reflected in it. And you have characters from different sort of ranks of the university system. I'm sure uh, one of the vice chancellors will find a place in the story. Uh, uh, it might be, who, who knows which vice chancellor, whether it will be the JNU or the AMU or the Jamia or whichever vice chancellor. But depending on uh, how this young writer chooses a vice chancellor as a character, they will be there. And then, of course, there will be teachers, there will be um, students in it, there will be uh, policemen and police women in it. Uh, we can imagine that story will contain all this. So, to contextualize that story, our um, teacher, and right now we are imagining that any of us might be that teacher that day, uh, would have to connect her students with the debates of 2019, December, which has just passed. And some of those debates are still going on in January 2020. So the teacher will have to introduce her students to these debates of our time. Question will be, uh, will that teacher exercise some degree of uh, um, autonomy? to choose the perspective from which she will look at these debates or will she be will she be cautious which most likely she will be as today also all of us have to be very cautious when we teach something which has a political overtone so perhaps the teacher will introduce teach, uh, her students to the idea that there was there was a sharp debate over a certain uh, law which had been passed already uh, but a lot of protest was going on against it and these were the two sides in that debate against which this story has tried to uh, create a plot and introduce certain characters. No matter how cautious she is, she will still need to 
show that the context was uh, riddled with a sense of confusion, uh, not just controversy, but real confusion. And that's, she will point out that that's probably what the title indicates, bugged out. And if she is an imaginative teacher, I'm quite sure that she will go into this title. You know, the Hindi word bhagda essentially derives from the longer phrase bhaga dori. And she will probably point out that this bhaga dori is a very interesting Hindi phrase and it's found in Punjabi as well in many other languages. Because the bhaga in it, which is bhag, bhagdar mein, jo bhaga hai, Bhage ka matlab hota hai escape. A lot of, when, when you try to run away from something, that's what bhagna means. And the dor is the exact opposite. When you engage with something and you run to achieve whatever is possible, that is dor. So, she will probably point out that this writer is trying to create some sort of an irony in the title bhagda, showing that the uh, people involved in this story were responding to the larger ethos of, her, of these times in which you felt like escaping from uh, the, the, the mess of daily struggles of life. At the same time, you were forced to engage with that mess and you were competing to the best of your capacity. So there was the attempt to bhagna and the attempt to dorna as well. And that is why the story is called Bhagdar because in the December of 2019, it virtually became a Bhagdar. Nobody knew who was going on which side. And also that politically the atmosphere was such that uh, it wasn't possible easily to take sides. And that the adults of that time were actually a bit themselves feeling um, very cautious, partly paralyzed in some ways. And the youth provided a breakthrough. And that is why the story is called Bhagdar because there was no direction. There was no leadership as such. Although a lot of people were pointing out uh, or saying that uh, the youth are being mobilized, the fact was that youth were actually leaderless. And that in fact, there was no leadership capable of uh, providing a direction to this youth of that time. That the youth were leading the leaders in a way. They were energizing various parties and showing to them that actually the situation is ripe for some mobilization. What are you doing? You are bankrupt. They were saying perhaps to all leaders of that time. And maybe it's in this background that this short story makes sense. Perhaps that teacher will proceed in these directions to kind of draw that story uh, into a bigger narrative of our times. And then try to inspire her students to scale the philosophical depths of the phenomenon of being a young person in such a time. Perhaps that teacher will also try to psychologize how it felt to be hit on your head even though you were the chosen uh, president of a major student union in the country, to be hit on your head with uh, you know, rods and not just sticks, and then to be charged uh, that you were the one who was inciting violence, and so on. Perhaps the story will, will build on these paradoxes and contradictions of our time. And the story will probably be also useful for stretching uh, the understanding of those future students about the very ambivalent and flexible role of the state and the state machinery. That in one campus, it's the police who perpetrated the violence, that is Jamia. And in another campus in the same city, uh, it's a, uh, it was a factional violence among students. And the police just escaped. They were part of the bhagdar. They bhago from the scene and didn't do anything. And somewhere, the larger machinery was involved as well in not letting the police intervene. We don't know exactly how the plot will move, but perhaps the teacher's job will be to deepen the awareness of those future students, uh, deepen their awareness about 
what this piece of writing actually means. She will treat it as a kind of an hermeneutic uh, composition which speaks to us uh, from a period which has passed and which has left behind a certain kind of landscape, a legacy you might call it. And that she will perhaps inspire her students to decipher that legacy of these times, the legacy of these times for the future. At that time, this would have become a little historical legacy. And this teacher will perhaps be able to inspire her students to uh, distinguish different elements in that, in that legacy. Certain elements will be of a purely political nature. Some elements will be of an economic nature. There will be plenty of sociology in it. There will be a lot of psychology in it. There will be perhaps shadows of parents of our time. Uh, there will be uh, fear. There will be uh, commitments. There will be caution. There will be all kinds of emotions that she might be able to inspire her students to feel through the story. Because ultimately any piece of literature is an invitation to empathize. To empathize with people who perhaps existed somewhere but probably exist only in words, uh, through symbols or um, through a structure that we call either poetry or plot in narrative and so on and so forth. Ultimately all literature is that. So she will try to create that sort of empathetic universe through which the students can participate in a time which they haven't seen uh, as, uh, as participants. Uh, they will be 20 years at that time, 22 years or whatever. I mean, no, second year students will be about 19, I suppose. So they, for them it will be kind of partly news, partly literature, uh, an invitation to uh, understand something in a larger perspective, basically. That's what teaching of humanities is generally about. To give us a perspective, to look at life, to look at history, to look at society and so on. And this teacher will use this story to do just that. Now introduce in this picture the digitality of that age, which will be surely even more intense than it already is in our time. I mean, we are you can say, uh, in the morning period of the digital era in the history of, long history of uh, uh, communication technology. And in 15 years time, perhaps many more things, many more objects, many more processes, many more complexities will have emerged uh, in the digital world. Uh, and as usual, uh, the students will be ahead in ahead of their teacher in engaging with the digitality of that time uh, as we are today. Uh, many of us are way behind our students in terms of how they are able to use the new technology for various purposes which people of your generation or my generation uh, find uh, a, a, a little bit challenging. Of course, God save the UGC, it pushes us to meet new challenges every day. <laughs> This morning it has uploaded my picture as a proof that this seminar was indeed held <laughs> and therefore I deserve to <laughs> get my uh, honorarium for it <laughs> and who knows 15 years from now what more UGC will require if the UGC does exist at that time. <laughs> so anyhow, introduce the digital element in uh, the life of this teacher of 2035 which we are trying to imagine being ourselves. Her students will tell her, ma'am or oh, sir, a lot of material is available about 2019 on the internet. And she'll say, great, now explore that material. See what you can find. And uh, see how you can uh, enrich your understanding of Bhagda uh, by looking at the media of that time, looking at the social media of that time, uh, looking at uh, comments of various people, uh, and so on and so forth. Bring to me whatever you can uh, that you explore. 
and yes, the landscape of their engagement with the story will suddenly become even more cluttered. Because they will notice that there are literally thousands and thousands of words available, images available, sounds available to make sense of the December of 2019 and the January of 2020. And even today we realize that, but they will realize it even more, that they are in a jungle. They are not just in Bhagdar, but they are actually in a jungle. And they would want their teacher to help them negotiate that jungle of responses, of uh, voices, of images, of actions uh, that were almost captured alive by the digital universe, by the digital resources of our time. And they would want somebody not to <coughs> hold their hand. Those students will probably be used to exploring this jungle themselves by then. But they would certainly want their teacher's perspective as to how to relate the short story writer's own perspective or angle with this vast resource material that they find uh, in the archives of the internet or in various other archives, which I'm sure by then would have become available, not merely on the internet, but in other forms. Uh, their university or college will probably be nothing more than a digital archive. Libraries would have become probably outdated by then. But maybe there will be some books, and it's possible that there are a few books or papers uh, written about these events in journals of uh, that time. Uh, some of these will be papers written by social scientists. Some of them will be simply editorials and articles written in newspapers. This teacher will be expected to, and perhaps she will want to, uh, negotiate some of this material herself in order to uh, take her students even deeper or farther into this matter. And when she tries to do that, she will, of course, face uh, numerous kinds of issues and problems, when you deal with such a vast resource of uh, information, imagery, sounds, and so on, you do need to pick and choose. And this will be a considerable task, a task which will require, uh, if you don't have research assistance, then it requires a lot of your own time. And this teacher will have to kind of uh, perhaps assign it to her students to say, all right, you, you distinguish uh, in this uh, whatever record exists of uh, tweets and Facebook um, entries and various other uh, sources that you've got. Try to classify them ideologically or try to classify them gender-wise, classify them um, in terms of where they were coming from, which universities, how they were responding or uh, distinguish which voices represent uh, uh, the administration, which uh, voices represent uh, uh, the students, and so on. She will want, to, want them to kind of use this material in some sort of systematic way uh, by classifying it and by interpreting those voices uh, on certain parameters of age or gender or where they were placed in the country and so on. Because obviously, if it's, a, if it's a short story about these times, it will probably indicate that this was something not so local, that this was something uh, on a larger scale, and that the law which was at the heart of it, uh, that law itself was something which requires us to take into account the bigger political or regional scenario of South Asia itself, because it's not a simple law. And that will help perhaps, help these students, help herself, to make sense of this great archive, this digital archive of the events of our time. I've used this example simply to come to the place where we can recognize the pedagogic issues involved in any pursuit 
which involves knowledge in the field of humanities today. And some of these issues will expectedly, understandably, become even more complex as time goes by. The issues have to do with not just the politics of our time, uh, the economy of our time, but these issues also have to do with the manner in which technology is participating in politics, in the economy, and in our social lives as well. This future teacher uh, will be a force to be interdisciplinary. Today we talk about interdisciplinarity as a, as a kind of a goal. And we feel that uh, this goal can be uh, better negotiated if our institutions are more flexible, um, if our courses are prepared in a certain uh, open, more liberal way with boundaries a little fuzzy than they are. And we are not able to quite often achieve those goals because the rigidities of the system uh, are quite strong. They are reflected in our employment conditions, the way our institutions are run, our timetables, our examination system, and so on. We can only hope and imagine that maybe in 15 years' time, interdisciplinarity will become a somewhat more achievable goal. You must have read uh, the Chief Justice of India uh, uh, speaking at a uh, seminar two days ago in Bangalore, where he said that judges require an interdisciplinary education today. Uh, the present Chief Justice said that if you just look at the number of cases we are dealing with right now, uh, no judge can deal with these cases if he or she does not have a perspective derived from different disciplines in a fused way, way that they meet together. He says, look, so, so many of our cases today are about religion, some of these are about culture, Many of them are about the constitutional definitions of freedom and privacy and equality and so on. And then there are cases where uh, very deep technological awareness is involved. Imagine the Aadhaar case and now there are many more cases. He said, I've just ruled on an internet related cases. Is it a fundamental right or not to have access to the internet uh, which has been blocked in Kashmir? He used these examples uh, a day before yesterday to uh, point out how important it is for education of judges, he meant, but we can imagine this is true for all of us, how important it is uh, for uh, people who are in different roles, professional roles in society today, to have the benefit that can only be derived when the epistemologies of different subjects prove a little porous and don't prove like national boundaries between India and Pakistan, <laughs> where any interloper is caught by a long distance telescope. Uh, the Chief Justice is obviously absolutely right uh, that we indeed are in a time when uh, past epistemologies that have guided the education system and our own training as teachers are not proving adequate anymore. And quite often we are stuck and we are unable to serve our students as well as we might otherwise uh, if ourselves we didn't have to uh, be constrained by frozen identities. You know, it's not every day uh, that you meet people who don't mind uh, talking to people across disciplines. Most of the time people say, Nene bhai, to physics ka say history ki baat kyo kar rahe and so on and so forth. Uh, luckily, women don't use that phrase saying that I'm a history girl. They just use the word Aadmi. There is a great gender advantage in that sense that women have that Hindi language doesn't provide such paralytic kind of phrases like that I'm a history girl, I'm a history girl, I'm a history girl, and so on and so forth. But these are realities. Uh, turf wars are common among disciplines, uh, among teachers of disciplines, and researchers, of course, and among journals. Hopefully these turf wars will be uh, 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 slightly uh, uh, less violent in the time that we are trying to project uh, into, for our example, of 2035. What is most important in this context when we are introducing in our imaginary universe the element of digitality 
what is most important today at this point for us to make this imagination slightly more meaningful is to notice the impact of the density uh, of resources available makes on the human capacity to do something which is fundamental for any pedagogic relationship. It goes without saying that education is essentially a relational activity. Pedagogic relations are at the core of education. And pedagogic relationship is between the teacher and students. As a relational activity, it calls for the same amount of time that any relational activity requires, starting with the family, for example. You know, it takes a long time for parents to uh, intensify their relationship with even a little baby. It takes years. And when they grow into adolescence and youth, it takes even longer. Relations take time to develop, and relations take time also to get deeper. Pedagogic relations are no different. They require a considerable investment of time. And this is one aspect of academic life which has gone through significant change in our time that the time available in a teacher's life to relate to students has been nibbled away. And if you now start to notice who has nibbled it away, then you will be able to draw quite a picture, quite a rich picture of the world which you can date, at least in India, from the early 90s onwards, or at best from mid 80s onwards. Now, this period that has passed since that time, let's say we are looking at 20 years of the new century and 20 years of the earlier century. It's a historical period of about 40 years or so. How do we look at this period in terms of institutions that have shaped education, the lives of teachers, the lives of students? What are the forces that have shaped this life? If you try to distinguish those forces, you will certainly come across the word which has different meanings for different people and perhaps not much meaning for a colonized society like ours, the word neoliberal. How can you speak about the 90s without writing this word, neoliberal? This hyphenated word seems to be of considerable global significance and people will tell you that Everything that has happened in this period can be explained by referring to the ideology of neoliberalism. It's not easy to explain that ideology, uh, even in the countries which enjoyed a long enough period for the growth of liberal institutions and values. It's even more difficult for us to define this ideology or to recognize it in our midst, uh, in a, in a, with a history that we live where liberal institutions actually never got enough time to impact society, where liberal values were actually just facing a kind of a childhood, you might say. It was actually about utilitarianism, uh, using the colony for enriching uh, the metropolis. Colonialism was a, uh, was a very, very complex uh, experience of history in which certain kinds of transfer of ideas and values did take place. But that transfer itself uh, remains uh, highly paradoxical. And that's why so many people call this period post-colonial rather than a period of independence. For the colonized, uh, independence is a considerable dream. It's a struggle. And uh, it's not easy for any society to engage with that struggle while also maintaining uh, some sort of survival conditions in the post-colonial world. In such a world, neoliberalism, again, seems to be a kind of a piecemeal exercise. I always remember uh, 
the late Hindi dramatist Mohan Rakesh for giving us the wonderful title for so many aspects of our life and this is no different. The title I am remembering is Aadhe Adhure. Mm -hmm. uh, we become liberal <laughs> but in an Aadhe Adhure sense. Our institutions, whether they are the UGC or a university or uh, the parliament itself, they are all liberal institutions of course, but in a sense that Rakesh would have called Aadhe Adhure. Their liberalism washes off like you know, a cheap uh, distemper uh, after a monsoon and we are witnessing that time in our own times. Where has neoliberalism brought us uh, in, in the academic world and how it has affected our life as teachers cannot be fully understood without putting into it the element of technology and its changes in the same period. In fact, there are many who would argue that uh, the growth of the hallmarks of neoliberalism uh, wouldn't have been possible without the advent of digital technology, that the two are deeply related. This, of course, is a highly uh, uh, complex debate because uh, the argument that technology has no politics, that it's simply a medium, uh, continues. That argument has a certain validity, but it's not easy to separate not just technology, but anything from history. And it's not easy to therefore notice that the market, which was the most powerful institution uh, in the hands of the neoliberal forces in this period of history, uh, was the driving force of the new technology as well. And therefore the new technology cannot be seen as a pure technology. In fact, there is no such thing as a pure technology. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go back to Gandhi in his Hind Swaraj, even the railways he said are ideological. Uh, and there is no technology which doesn't have the potential at least to be ideologically exploited by the political forces of the time in which the technology emerges and in which it expands on the wings of uh, economic uh, change and growth. And the same applies to the digital technology. Digital technology has certainly facilitated neoliberal uh, forms of governance. And the UGC cannot be singled out in this matter. If it's demanding uh, uploading of uh, not just every event like this one, but even it's demanding the uploading of uh, seminars and ordinary classes. If uh, chief ministers of so many different Otherwise, political ideologies, as different as Mr. Khattar and Mr. Kejriwal, are both demanding school <coughs> teachers to uh, uh, show their fingerprints to prove that they were present in the school. If chief ministers across the country are demanding that schools be fitted with CCTV, uh, so that it, what the teacher writes on the blackboard can be seen by somebody who, uh, who is supposed to be more powerful than the teacher. If so ubiquitous and so consensual are the uses of tech, uh, is the use of technology in the eyes of those who hold power, then surely the technology is an ideological tool in our times. That it's a tool of surveillance goes without saying. Otherwise, you cannot explain uh, the vast amount of money which, despite economic constraints, has been spent on equipping schools and colleges with CCTVs. We cannot explain without this ideological uh, claim. We cannot explain how uh, fingerprinting has become so common in educational institutions. And certainly on the matter of online admissions, online application for various kinds of employment and, and so on, uh, the wholesale transfer of a paper-based process of administration to a digital administration system in which India is very different from even the most economically advanced Western countries, this wholesale transfer cannot be explained uh, without reference to the possibility that technology is an ideological tool. Uh, you are probably aware that even in countries like the United States, Japan or United Kingdom, it's possible to say that I will not submit my application online. 
I would prefer a postal application and that freedom is permissible both for admission to an institution as well as for application for a job. We have gone overboard in this matter and we can ask ourselves, uh, is it just our desire to catch up and be ahead of the West? Uh, or is it uh, something that requires further analysis to understand uh, the psychological conditions in which administration works in our country today? All these are very valid questions to understand what has happened to teacher <coughs> and his time. Because this future teacher will require all that time it takes to wade through digital resources to understand the story of Bhagdad and to explain. Where is that time going to come from? Look at the last 20 years, uh, during which I've had many years of active service, during which no matter who you were, whether you were an assistant or an associate or a full professor, your time was up for being nibbled away for duties that you had always respected your support staff for. This is a time during which support staff has dwindled, shrunk, and in many institutions, disappeared. Consider the examination section support staff, which used to be responsible for all stages of the printing of the examination paper. Today, for many of those stages, the teachers are responsible. And in many institutions, it's the ad hoc teacher. Uh, or the contractual teacher who makes it possible for the institution to conduct the examination. But even senior professors are responsible now, associate professors are responsible now for a range of duties which barely 50 years ago they would have thought is not exactly the best use of their time. Uh, they were institution institutional arrangements for those duties. If you look at the way in which staffing <coughs> patterns of nearly every institution have changed in this period, you will notice that while the teaching staff itself has become more vulnerable because of the introduction of new methods of temporary appointments, the support staff has shrunk even further and institutions that would have a support staff of, let's say, 20 at a point today, might have just five, starting with the principal's own support staff. And these are global trends. As a result of these tr tr trends, and they are global trends, but at the same time, they are more intensively followed in countries which were already under a crunch and or, or which have volunteered to be faster than the West. Uh, so, and our country is in that category. So what has happened as a result of all that is that uh, the teacher has far less time uh, to do what is the primary responsibility of the teacher, namely to relate to her students, to find time to relate to students. And modern pedagogic theory, of course, says don't just relate to your students as a mass. Attempt to relate to every student as an individual. That is the heart of 20th century uh, pedagogic theory. That if you recognize that every student is different, that every child is different, and even though the student at undergraduate or graduate level is an adult, yet that student is different from the rest, and therefore it's not just in the PhD program that you relate to an individual, you relate to an individual in every program. Well, the travesty of over time is that even at the PhD level, we cannot find enough time now, as many of our PhD students will tell us, uh, that they don't feel that their guide has spent enough time with them. Where has this time gone? I recommend to you a book by two professors of University of Toronto. This has been a remarkable book because it's not published by a private publisher but by the University of Toronto Press which is an official press and therefore I imagine that this book has some academic uh, sanctity to it. It's written by two uh, women professors her names are Barbara C C Sieber and Maggie Berg. The book is titled Slow Professor. The subtitle is 
challenging the culture of speed in the academy. Now this is not a book about opinions of these two ladies on what has been happening. It's a book densely packed with summaries of studies that they have accessed to point out the role of the digital technology in making the teacher's life a breakneck speed life. The gist of the book is that the primary role of the teacher to be a thinker, to be a person who has time to reflect and who inducts young people into a community of people who know how to reflect, that role has been jeopardized. And they say that this has happened under the auspices of this remarkable resource that the technology has gifted to the administrator of the university and the college system. They speak, of course, about surveillance, but they also speak about simple tasks. Simple tasks like doing your emails, for example, or making reservations for a guest who is uh, coming from another institution, or, or uh, for being available to your own dean or principal uh, for meetings or discussions, or for being available to somebody uh, from a distance on Skype. They describe a life which is a 24 by 7 life. It's not the subtitle of NDTV. They say this is the life of an average teacher, no matter how senior that person is. That that person is all the time available. Of course, in uh, many institutions, availability is required not just for the administrators, but is also required for, by the students and uh, new laws in many so-called progressive institutions in the world require that no matter what time of the day or night it is, you have to be accessible by your student, lest he or she is facing an emotional trauma. That is the one thing which teachers are now supposed to be very cautious about and afraid of, that they were not available when the student was going through an emotional trauma. You are also uh, responsible for the larger uh, administrative world of institutions that govern research funding, institutions that govern your life um, as a peer reviewer, uh, journals and various others. Uh, Professor uh, Sieber and Berg portray a life which is quite suffocating in fact. If you read this book, by the fourth chapter you will begin to feel stifled. And as you move on to the end, you will feel that this is certainly not what I thought academic life is. And this is what they portray it is in one of the best universities in a developed economy. Their argument is that it's no more possible to rescue or salvage academic life of a teacher unless we reassert our claim to a slower life as a collective, as individuals, unless we recall that life of a teacher or scholar acquires its meaning only when it is slow and loses its meaning when it's forced to speed up. Unless we make that claim today, these two writers say we may, be, we may lose the very heart of academic life, what it means to belong to one such life. And if we lose it, they also warn us, then the role that the younger people expect us to perform will also, of course, be sacrificed. If we are unable to think, if we are not able to focus, if we are not able to spend the time it takes to develop a larger perspective, a higher perspective on things, not just things that we have to teach, but in, on life itself, if we are not in that role, which a teacher is often in the life of a person much younger than herself or himself, then the ultimate sufferer will be our student. 
it doesn't matter who benefits. It may be a corporation, it may be a government, it may be a principal. Uh, beneficiaries can be many. But the loser has to be identified as the next generation. That's where they close this very densely argued account. At this moment, I want to introduce you to another new book. And this is about, uh, it's a neurological, a neuroscientist's book on reading. This is Marianne Wolf, uh, a professor of uh, neuroscience, who has written a book called Reader Come Home. And the subtitle is The Reading Brain in a Digital World. Now, this is, of course, a very technical book. And if you have the patience to go through it, you will uh, soon recognize uh, the amount of uh, research which Professor Marianne Wolf has herself carried out over the last 20 years and the research that she has also summarized in this book, Reader Come Home. By institutions, by economic circumstances in that direction. You are a teacher of literature, you are being told to prepare your students for a life in the media. You are a student of, you are a teacher of economics, you are being told they should be market worthy for serving as a consultant to an industry. You are a teacher of political science, you are being told don't be too political. Uh, teach them <laughs> to be <laughs> members of parliament who will vote by the party whip <laughs> or something like that. Don't open their minds. Regiment them. That is what the policy is saying across the board, which is so, so strange for, for educational discourses to ultimately converge on. Regimentation is not education. It's military science. Education is the opposite of regimentation. 